Live from Paradise Studios in New York, Strong Island Television presents Unger the Radar, starring Randy Unger. Brought to you by Magnitude Jewelry. Add a two to match your attitude. Tonight, we're going to be interviewing director Eric Traman and producer, actor Tyson Turo of the new comedy film, Loners. Randy will also be reviewing the new films, Plus One, The Dead Don't Die, and Men in Black International, with special guest critics Erica A., C.J. Oakley, and Matt Warren. And now, here's your host, Randy Younger. Hey guys, I'm Randy Unger, and welcome to Unger the Radar, where we talk all things film. And first off, I just want to wish all those dads out there a very happy Father's Day. Um, I hope you had a great day with your sons and daughters. And also, it's good to be back in the studio, because last weekend I was out in Los Angeles for Ghostbusters Fan Fest, where I had a great time. I met some great people, uh, great stars were there, and a lot of fun events were going on all weekend and you're actually going to hear more about that later this week. I'm going to do a, a recap video of that. But first off, I've got a very special guest with me right now on the phone. We've got the director uh, Eric Tremon and producer actor Tyson Tarot of the new uh, comedy uh, Loners. Guys, are you there? We are. Thanks for having us on. Sure. Anytime, yeah, guys. Thank you. Great. Welcome. Welcome. So, guys, let's just dive right in. Um, it's a very strange film. Would you would you call this a, a comedy, a drama, or a dramedy? <laughs> well, personally, I characterize it as a as somewhat of a black comedy. Mm. You know, it's satirical in nature, so uh, not everyone keys into that. But that's definitely what's going on there. It's, it's it's kind of in line with some of the films from the past that we really love, like Doctor Strange Love and you know other political satire. So nice. And now, tell everybody the, the premise. It's, um, it's kind of a strange, it's about the government trying to force um, these loners into being more social, or is it the other way around? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, this is Tyson Turo. I'm the, the producer, and I also star in it, um, one of the stars. So uh, the, the premise is the government is trying to look like it's doing something about violence in America. Mm -hmm. So they decide that they can scapegoat introverts or, or loners mm -hmm. because when you hear somebody, you know, commit an act of violence, they always say, yeah, he's stuck to himself. So if you're suspected of being a loner, you're forced into this government mandated group therapy by the government called Lonanon. Mm -hmm. And we follow this kind of uh, wacky group of introverts as they are in the middle of this government conspiracy and they have to come together to stand up for the right to be alone. Wow. It's kind of a quirky premise. Uh, how did it originally come about? Uh, well, we were. I was in a uh, a play in Los Angeles called Lone and On. It was written by Neil McGowan, and I think there were six of us in the play. And um, and I had a chance to make a movie uh, because of a friend named David Wellborn, who's another producer on this. And so I asked uh, Eric, who we both went to USC film school together, if he wanted to look at the play and see if he thought we could make it into a movie. And he liked the idea. Hmm. So we worked about a year on adapting the, the movie or the, the play into a film uh, with, with Neil writing the adaptation of his own play. And about a year and a half later, we were filming it. Wow. So, Eric, how did you come on board? Uh, much like Tyson just suggested, uh, he invited me out to see – a uh, small play that he was in, and it had gotten decent reviews, I think, in the LA Weekly and maybe some other publications. And so I kind of did a little research on it after going to see it and uh, was like, oh, you know, other people like this as well or think that it has merit. And it was in line with some of the things that I always wanted to talk about in, in film. Yeah. And I felt like for a first film, it would be a very um, – interesting first film because it's like you know comedy is like notoriously difficult and because of the subject matter it was like it was actually pretty scary to me because i felt like like you know to do it service and to do it um to do the story justice but then also not to tread um into insensitive territory would be a very kind of like interesting thing to balance and so um you know i'm up for challenges so that's why i was like yeah let's do this tyson and, and you know we 
we like like Tyson mentioned, we sat next to each other in class at USC, so we had a pretty long history. So it felt like a good good fit. Okay, and now it has a, a pretty strong uh, political message. Um, was that your intention all along? Uh, yeah, it totally was. Um, you know, the film, uh, the timeline for the film came about long before any of the current administration was in place. Hmm. So it's, I, I like saying this in interviews because I don't want people to get the idea that, you know, like you always hear people saying things about, you know, liberal filmmakers from Hollywood go and start talking all this stuff about politics and whatnot and kind of inserting ourselves into a situation that we shouldn't be in for whatever reason. But um, this film was not really intended to be a direct comment on current political standings. Mm. It was more just a general approach to like what we felt and kind of like some of the things that we thought might be funny uh, now so that so if we see parallels between what's happening currently and what might be happening during the course of this film in a sense that's really really kind of ironic and sad in a lot of ways because it wasn't it was really just supposed to be complete satire mm-hmm. yeah we actually shot the film four years ago and oh, really? uh, I would say if anything um, I felt like it has a good message about it'd be nice if the government actually did something rather than scapegoat individuals and, and just try to play on people's fears. So, Okay. Wow, wow. Right. Uh, now, I'm curious, guys. What, you got a great cast. Um, you got St- Stephen Tab- Tablowski in here. Um, what was the casting process like? Uh, so I've, I've been an actor for about 20 years now. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Basically, we just called in favors from all of our acting friends. Uh, I knew Stephen from a, an acting class that I took with him. He's been one of my favorite actors um, mm. since I was a kid because I, I fell in love with, with film and I was on the set of Selma Louise, and Stephen was in that. <laughs> and uh, Kari Payton was a, a friend of a couple other people in the cast, um, uh, Will, Will Greenberg and, and uh and Rob Kirkovich both went to USC with me, and they're on TV shows now. And so basically, we just we just called in favors from friends, and and they came and and shot the movie with us for a day. And and uh, yeah, we couldn't be more proud of the uh, of the cast. Yeah, the cast really turned out great. Tyson did such a huge you know job putting all that stuff together and really coordinating that effort. Uh, you know, like most indie films, don't have anywhere near as large of a cast right. or you know known. Um, known cast members from other larger ventures so it, it was really pretty cool to be able to work with such such high caliber talent on this project yeah my my main takeaway from the film is definitely the camaraderie between all the lo- the, the loners um and yeah just the acting was just phenomenal in that respect coupled with the with the great script i think you guys have a really great film here thank you very much yeah. Yeah, thank you yeah, it was really fun because we had, like I said, we had six people in the in the play, and they're all in the uh, in the movie, hmm. and so we already had, already had this great chemistry. And then Eric really wanted to do rehearsal hmm. because we shot the film in twelve and a half days, so it was really essential that we already had this chemistry and already, you know, knew how we were gonna be with each other. And I think that really came into play with the film. Great, great. Now, I'm yeah. sure I'm sure it wasn't a totally easy set to work in. Uh, were there, what were some challenges you guys faced on set? <laughs> so, I'll let uh, you take that, Eric. <laughs> yeah, well, so working at the speed that we had to work at right. was extremely difficult because, you know, you're trying to cover, um, you know, and by coverage, I don't just mean like, you know, starting off in a wide shot and then moving into a close-up. You're trying to cover the situation in enough varied ways that you can actually eke out more of a story if you need to in the post-production process because essentially you get three chances to tell a tell a story in filmmaking you have your pre-production process principal photography and then post-production where you can actually kind of like weave things around if things aren't working but you can't change things that you didn't shoot so uh being able to get that kind of coverage with you know upwards of eight actors in a room at any given time was extremely difficult and trying to do it on the timetable that we had was it was almost impossible. So I resorted to some kind of, um, let's just say, uh, <laughs> improvisational methods to try to get some of the stuff, you know, the extra footage that we would need to help construct the story later. Okay. Tyson? Tyson? Hello? You still there? Yep, here. Yeah. What were some challenges you faced, Tyson? Uh, well, 
the challenges, I guess one of the challenges personally was that, um, like I say, I had uh, been acting for quite a while, but I hadn't produced. So hmm. this was sort of like a, a film school for me. Um, so just trying to get up to speed on, you know, what a good producer does. And, um, you know, making sure that all the relationships and everything were smooth behind the scenes. I don't know how good a job I um, did with yeah. everything, but um, I tried. <laughs> I'll speak to that. Um, so, you know, having sat next to this guy in film school and, you know, being kids basically and growing up together, it, to see him step into the role of a producer um, for his first time, you know, on a major or big project like this, he absolutely killed it. And I did tell him this, you know, like, so this isn't the first time he's hearing this, but like, I really, really did admire what he was able to pull off given the fact that, you know, this is, it was all new to him. Uh, so I'm really proud of what he pulled off too. Like, I think he did a great job. And, and like he said, you know, keeping, keeping varied personalities together is a difficult thing. And just like, being able to like orchestrate communication between two people is difficult enough when it, let alone 130 or whatever it was that we had in our crew and cast. Right. Uh, so it was, it was a huge undertaking and I think it went off very, very well. Uh, like there were no real arguments on set and stuff and everything was for the most part, it ran really smoothly. So now Tyson, what was it like wearing two hats? Was it, was it difficult or did you just kind of ease into it? Um, I'm, I'm glad that I already had a lot of acting experience <laughs> so that um, I, I made sure to not, you know, give myself a giant role in the film. And I guess I'm, I'm one of a, an ensemble, but I, um, I, yeah, anyway, I, I wanted to make sure that I, I could have that peace of mind to worry about producing things and act at the same time. So mm. it was kind of interesting, you know, sometimes while I was acting, um, just watching everything, watching the machinations of the film crew while I'm acting, you know, trying to make sure that everything is going well. And um, I, I tried to remind, remind myself to just let go while the cameras were rolling. It's pretty funny that he says that because he's actually admitting something that I saw him doing. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, you know, like it, the, one of the things about being a director is you're trying to be as observant as possible of everything that's going on around you. Mm -hmm. And so you're paying attention to what's happening with your cast members and whatnot. And he kept looking at the mechanism. I'm like, I didn't say anything to you about it, but I was like, dude, you got to just focus on what you're doing. Not that you were doing a bad job or anything. You were in the moment. <laughs> But at the same time, like as soon as we would call cut, I could see that you were kind of trying to figure out what's happening with the mechanism. And it's like, oh, just turn your blinders on and you're good. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, it's good to have communication on set, obviously. So that's awesome. Yes. Um, last question, guys, and I'll let you go. Um, what do each of you hope uh, audiences take away from the film? Hmm. Tyson, you can go first. Um. What I try to do with, with my storytelling is to entertain an audience and then sort of trick them in, into putting themselves in the shoes of someone else that they don't necessarily think about. Because hmm. I think that that's ultimately what's going to bring our world and our country together, you know? Hmm. And so I know that sounds kind of heavy, especially <laughs> for a comedy, but I hope that um, audiences walk away and think, you know... Um, Am, are, am I am I buying into, you know, maybe fear mongering of other people, or, or, um, you know, am I am I being lazy when it comes to putting myself in the shoes of other people? I hope they they laugh and have a good time, and then think uh, maybe I could do a little bit more empathizing. Okay, cool, Eric. Yeah, and uh, for me personally, uh, I've always felt that filmmaking was it's it at its very core, it's a, it's an examination of character in circumstances because that's i mean every film you know it's got characters in it and they're placed you know faced against different obstacles or something going on to prevent them from getting what they actually desire in some way okay so from that standpoint i felt it was a complete exploration of character you know in this modern state of loneliness mm. and uh the idea of examining the differences between being alone and being lonely were very intriguing to me so i, I wanted other people to kind of see that they weren't alone in that thought process, you know, and, and, and be able to maybe get a chuckle out of it, even if they were introverted and, and, you know, to understand that you can revel in your own personality and not have to feel, not have to feel like an outsider. Um, 
So it, it, it was very, like, on numerous levels for me, I wanted it to communicate with an audience and have them feel good about themselves and stuff after the film was over. So that's nice. really what it boiled down to for me. Just a lighthearted kind of romp. Awesome, awesome. Well, Eric and Tyson, uh, the film is great. Uh, best of luck with it. And um, also, if you're ever in Long Island, New York, we'd love to maybe have you come down for a, an in-person interview. That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, Randy. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. Uh, and, I, and I'll mention that uh, Loners is available for free on Amazon Prime. Yes. There you go. All right, guys, check it out, Loners. It's an awesome uh, dark comedy. So, guys, we're going to take a short commercial break, but we'll be back with uh, our film review segment right after this. Thanks, Randy. Under the Radar is brought to you by Magnitude Jewelry. Add a two to match your attitude. Patent pending interchange genuine gemstone and crystal EMF protection jewelry. For more information, please visit magnitudejewelry.com slash gemgirl or call Hey guys, we're back. I'm your host, Randy Unger, and this is Unger the Radar. And we'll meet with me today is a wonderful panel of guest critics. Uh, we've got Mr. Matt Roran. Hello, sir. Welcome back. Hello. Good to be back. <laughs> yes, yes. Erica A., hello again. Glad to be here. Oh, yes. Good to see you again, oh, Randy. Oh, you too. Yeah, for sure. And CJ Oakland. Yeah, it's been a while. It has, but you're, you're a staple here. You're a regular at this, on the couch. So guys, we're, let's, we're just going to dive right in because we've got three movies to talk about. Um, not all that great. Some are better than others. It's a, it's a mixed bag, as usual. Um, so first off, uh, we've got Plus One. This, uh, it's a smaller film. I'd call it a rom-com drama. Uh, about a, a, guy and a, a young guy, young girl. They're, they're good friends. who go, They've decided to just go to every wedding they can. There they are. Um, ten weddings in wedding season, and they have no dates, so they go with, decide to go uh, to them together. And, uh, you know, it's pretty predictable what happens. And, uh, I mean, this movie, it, it was okay. It didn't impress me. It was enjoyable. It was yeah, cute. It, it was, was cute. sort of funny. And the, the leads were okay. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Y- yeah. <laughs> Erica, yeah. Fine, I'm going, okay. Yeah, go first. The Ladies first. The acting was fine. The music was fine. Okay. The music was well edited. That It didn't overpower when they were doing their vocals. Mm. The plot-wise was predictable. Yeah. And I felt that the plot was missing the most important part of a romantic comedy. The part where you cry. The part where you feel for the person who just screwed up the relationship. I don't think I've ever cried and during a romantic comedy, though. Okay, then. <laughs> Girls cry, I okay, guess. Okay, okay. I, I cry every movie. <laughs> yes. All right. So it was missing that aspect. It just sort of went like, oh, now we're going to punch you in the gut, and two minutes later, we're mm. all better, happy ending, end of movie. Yeah. It was well made, but it just was missing so much, and there was nothing to really draw you in. I do like the fact that it kind of went up and down, kind of like life in a way. It wasn't okay. as predictable as I, as I thought it was going to be. But um, it was fun. I mean, Matt, what did you... Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it was uh, fairly predictable. Yeah. Uh, Jack Quaid, uh, who plays the lead, uh, the son of Meg Ryan and, and oh, is it really? Dennis Quaid. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's great. You know... Looks well, nothing uh, like them. No. <laughs> uh, I, I find him likable. Uh, I'd like to see him in something that has more... Meat to it. Meat to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, he's definitely got... Some elements of his like father's delivery, yeah, at a time more of a goofier uh, version. Oh, it was my... like classic '80s Dennis Quaid, like yeah. you know, inner like space, inner space. <laughs> yes. you know, like the Meg Ryan and, and Dennis Quaid. There you go. Yeah. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the soundtrack was great. Uh, mm-hmm. I was the, the entire thing was real. The band Real Estate, uh, so mm-hmm. that was nice. Yeah, um, it was a good. smooth ride. Was very whole... smooth. Yeah, um, yeah. I I could honestly watch like. Uh, 
75 minute just clips of the uh, best man <laughs> toasts. Okay. <laughs> Those are always great. Yeah, uh, it and, was uh, offbeat, which I, I yeah, really it was respect. offbeat. Yeah, uh, not nearly enough Beck Bennett. Uh, he's in oh, the yeah. very beginning and the very end. He would have been a good lead in this. I yeah, think. They switched that. You know, yeah, he's a great actor. SNL. Yeah. Yep. Uh, CJ, what, what were your thoughts? I guess I'm the outlier here because I really enjoy this one. Uh huh. <laughs> which to me, like, I usually don't like romantic comedies because the writing I find are usually very terrible. Like they're usually the most predictable plots. Right. And the characters aren't usually engaging. And this one, I actually really enjoyed them because they were written very realistically. Like, mm -hmm. I felt like I was watching two pure people, like, dealing with their relationship. Yeah. And as you guys keep saying, it's predictable. It's like, well, the two people are going to keep going to each other as each other's plus one to the weddings. And I'm like, okay, at the end of the movie, they're going to realize they're perfect for each other, and that's the whole thing. But instead, they do it halfway through the movie. Right, decide, right, right, Let's take right. a chance of this. And it explores them trying to be this relationship. And that's what I enjoy, because romantic comedies almost never do that. Right. I don't think so. I think about half the time they do. That well, they, that it was like a come, premature okay, so They come to coupling. the point where they come together, and that's when one of them screws it up. And I was saying that what was missing after the part where they realized they should be together, and mm. one of them pulls away, you don't get the real heart-jerking feeling of how. Yeah. The character is screwing everything up, and he just realized it. Erica, I agree with you on that one. This kind of felt like more of a watered down when Harry met Sally, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Speaking of my Ryan, there she is. She's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's the well. I mean, she's the queen of romance. She's the rom com queen. I yeah. mean, I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, guys, uh, you see it, skip it. What do you think? I'd say see it. I'd see it. <laughs> see, it's, it. see it? It's hitting the radar. It's yeah. not like yeah. directly no, in the no, center. No, no. It's not a bullseye, but... But this is a lot better than some of the other... They've been on the show a lot more than you, <laughs> yeah. and I've, I've subjected oh, them to a yeah, really terrible movie. This wasn't It's painful. better than Acapulco. I went in expecting to hate it. I went in expecting to be like, okay, it's just a bad generic romantic comedy. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It actually caught me laughing like when I didn't want to, and I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm actually... It definitely has some good jokes. My main draw was I saw Ed Begley Jr.'s name attached. Oh, so I was like, why not? He, and he has the he has father. He's scenes. great. Yeah, I always love Ed. I definitely yeah. would like to see more from like the writer and director of this one because, like, mm -hmm. they, yeah. I feel like they did a really good job and with more of a budget. They can do like a yeah. Oh, sure. Better film. I think they did a good job with this one. Is, if, is this the debut film? Uh, it feels that way. I'm not. It feels like it, and I yeah. hope it is. Uh, yeah. Well, and it's a good internet. debut if it is. What do you guys think of uh, the leads, Maya Erskine and Jack? I like them. Yeah, I like them. I don't. The Maya Erskine. It's an acquired taste. I'm really, I've seen her in other stuff here and there, mm -hmm. but something about her is like kind of off. I don't know if I'm mm. a huge fan yet. I don't get that. Like, I really enjoy seeing her work. Like every time I see her pop in, and I really enjoyed her performance in this yeah. one. Yeah. Like the way she was able to play this character was uh, really yeah. well done. Yeah, she was good. And, and like I said, I think I didn't like Jack Quaid that much as much mm. as you, Matt. Um, I think it could have been any kind of goofy, right. quirky leading man, but. Yeah. It was what it was, and it was actually an, an enjoyable film. So, yeah. I say see it. You guys see it. See it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why not? See it. Eh. It's, a, it's an eh. <laughs> Don't look it out, but if you have free time, it's definitely worth the time. Okay. If you have, yeah, I think it's an hour and thirty-three or something. Something like that. Like that. Something like that. Okay. I'd say see it. Uh, all right. Next up, guys, a much more fun film. Uh, from the, the latest from director Jim Jarmusch, or is it Jarmish? You, Jarmish. Jarmish? Jarmush? Okay, we should probably I've know. I've always heard of Jarmush. Is that's it Jarmush? Is I it? I don't know the uh, actual way, but that's the way. Or I, I always say Jarmish. Is Jarmish, like, not... I don't know. It, Agree I've to been, disagree. I've been watching his movies for years. Yeah. He's, like, a, a, a director I love. All I know right. is he cameoed in an episode of Bored to Death as himself, and they called him Jim Jarmusch, but I don't know if that was actually his name or just the fact that that's what everyone calls well, him. Well, <laughs> if the majority is saying it, then yeah. it, it could be true. So, um, basically, it's the dead don't don't die. It's an ensemble cast. You got what? Bill Murray, Adam Driver, uh, Selena Gomez, Chloe Savini, 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 <laughs> another name. Uh, Tilda Swinton, Tom Waits, Iggy Pop, Danny Glover, Steve Buscemi. It's a crazy cast. Basically, it's just it's sort of a standard zombie movie formula. Small town overrun by flesh eating uh, ghouls, and it's up to the so the three the three person police department. Uh, to do battle with these zombies. And there's some really meta moments in there, which I'm not going to give away. Those are some of the spoilers. Yeah. And I'm just going to say they're meta, and it's awesome. And you've got Bill Murray just being deadpan Murray. Uh, Adam Driver, I think, steals the show here. Oh, his delivery is incredible. He's great. I love his dry, yeah. just like... <laughs> Every, everything he says. I know. I mean, ever since uh, the show Girls, I, I've been mm -hmm. following his career. You have Star yeah. Wars, this. Uh, um, I still need to see Patterson. Yeah. His, uh, Jim yeah. Jarmusch's last film, yeah. Patterson, 
uh, is a must see. Where he plays a, a bus driver. Yeah. So I got to check it. that out. But um, this was a strange one, um, and it was enjoyable. I was wanted to see what was happening. I wanted to see the the interplay between all the the big stars, yeah. especially Murray and Driver. But um, CJ, what what are yeah. your thoughts? This one like. The mistake people seem to be making is they think it's a zombie movie. It's an art house film that happens to have zombies. And right. That's what you need yeah. to know going in. Like this is Jim Jarmusch. Right, right. Like Dead Man is one of my favorite like non-linear storytelling mm-hmm. movies. Yeah, yeah. I love like, Broken Flowers actually. Yeah, there's a lot of like really interesting stuff he does. Mm-hmm. So you got to go into this one knowing like it's going to have this strange offbeat style to it. Right. And it's not meant to be a straight up zombie film. But I enjoyed the zombies how they did them. Like yeah. they did an interesting approach to it, and the effects are actually pretty good. Chardonnay. Kind of <laughs> yeah. yeah, they did like a lot of good moments and yeah. I think the actors did a good job as well which they did like a lot of really like deadpan and toned down performances but you could tell that's definitely intentional like oh, that's right. how yeah, Jim do it. it's like I want you to act like you're bored so that when we do these fourth wall breaking moments and like the meta jokes it's like it almost feels like the actor is like reacting to it and that sure. worked very well for mm-hmm. the film yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, and it's called Centerville, so they're all like very centered and very direct and focused in their one, you know, like very monotone type of characters. Um, Erica, thoughts? I'm so afraid I mean, to ask. Okay. <laughs> let's go. All right, let's go. So first of all, I thought they were centered more because they thought they were the center of the universe, and they have these people who came from a city, uh-huh. Selena Gomez and her friends, who more like a cameo role than an actual, right, I would right, call right. them anyone who's actually part of the cast, and they're right. referring to them and it's just there are many characters and they each have their little segment right, and their right, little right. part and it's sort of a zombie <clears throat> movie it has a few gross moments mm. that I was like great look away uh. <laughs> and it is truer to the zombie concept than maybe let's take World War Z which oh. bounced around all over the place yeah, but no. as for a zombie movie like you said you can't look at it as a zombie movie you have to look at it as I know. a pan straightforward like, tongue-in-cheek type comedy. I went in thinking it was going to be like a Shaun of the Dead type. You know? It wasn't quite Not Shaun like of a the straight Dead. Up zombie it wasn't movie. quite Zombie Land. Right, right, it was right. just... And they, yes, they did an okay job breaking the fourth wall, something yeah. Mel Brooks did well, and Deadpool everyone now thinks of as that. Uh, <laughs> right. Where it's like, oh, what does the script say? Yeah. And there are a few spoilers, and then there's this one part where I just totally lost concentration in the movie, <laughs> and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, am I even a Marvel movie now? Look, it's the, it's the master from the magical universe of <laughs> Doctor Strange, and she has oh, a sword. Oh, Tilda Swinton. Yes. Very similar role, I though. I someone needs to tell Hollywood Tilda Swinton isn't Asian. <laughs> <laughs> they keep making this mistake. Yes, it's a very weird exactly. Yeah. But that's <laughs> where I found I just lost track of the movie, and I'm she like... She looks very mystical and very sage-like. And so. I'm like, okay, uh, she's the character. Celtic ninja who left the magical world of Doctor Strange, and well, now doc- she's here killing With a shaved some. head this time. Well, I said well, no, her no. hair she, she had a, No, shaved head in, in yes. Doctor Strange. And here, she has I'm, this very long And then long I hair. liked every time they made, in case we weren't sure who the lead was, they'd make these little Star Wars jokes, and I'm like, mm. oh, okay, haha. The first few times it was amusing. <laughs> Were you a fan of uh, Bill Murray and Adam Driver? They pretty much Bill look- Murray, yes. Adam Driver is very hit and miss for me. Mm, okay. I'd say he's not quite someone I'm a fan of. But he hasn't he earned does- your respect yet? It's not that. I be- like I said, hit and miss. I believe that he's capable of doing good things, and then he's capable of things I went, oh, oh yeah, there he is too. Great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, fair enough. And so as the movie goes, there are a few spoilers. I'm not going to say much. Right. And I think that it's more that the female sheriff I wouldn't include as part of the team of three. She wasn't a sheriff. She was just part of the the, par- the police department. She had a badge. But she wasn't a sheriff. Well, she right. Was a deputy. The deputy. deputy. There's one yeah. sheriff. Everyone else is a deputy. They, okay. They, okay. Like three of them. I love it. <laughs> but the sheriff's department, I was able right, to right. count her as part oh, of the okay, team. Oh, okay. That's but fine. But it was just a pair of them fighting zombies. Okay. Chloe, how do you pronounce it? Chloe Savini? Savini. Savini. Damn it. These, names. These people and their names. Yeah, damn them. <laughs> Just be Will Smith. <laughs> I can pronounce that. Yes. Danny Glover. There Danny you go. Danny Glover. Uh, Danny Glover uh, was great in it. He was great. like... He Him and Buscemi. He only, they only had like, <laughs> like between them like maybe 10 minutes on screen. Yeah. It's sad. Well... <laughs> The one thing, it, it's like, you know, the, the, when when they say, like, it stars this this person, this yeah, person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, literally no star of this movie. It's many, many cameos. Yeah. I mean, I guess, like, Adam Driver, Bill Murray, Chloe Savigny. Yeah. Savig- <laughs> Close but enough. they're, like, the, the leads. Right, right. And then everyone else is, like, a cameo. True. Because I, th- I think Selena yeah. Gomez was, like, the fourth built. Yeah. <laughs> the way I saw it is, like, it seems less like it's supposed to be, like, 
their cameos, and it's more like you're watching several horror movies happening at the same time, all happening <laughs> in the same place. Like the sheriffs are like the theme of their own movie, where like they've mm-hmm. got to help save the town. Right. You have like uh, the comic book nerd and Danny Glover, where like right. they wanna... the heart- oh, Thank you for bringing that. Hey, Caleb Landry Jones, who was yeah. in Get Out. Awesome young actor. He's, he's yeah. been popping up in a lot of things and lately. And he's good in everything. And <laughs> he's he is great. He's, I don't know. Is he? He's not British. Is he British? I don't know. He was. Uh, no, uh, what was he? he was in um, Three Billboards. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, it, yeah, he he's just phenomenal. And he's like what, not even thirty years old. Yeah. He's, he's got a, quite a, a filmography under him. Yeah. So I want to see more of him. Um, all right. So Jim Jar Jarmusch. <laughs> I've only uh, honestly seen. Um, Coffee and Cigarettes and Broken Flowers. Uh, and it's funny, CJ, that you mentioned this is, felt like an anthology film, all the different storylines. Mm-hmm. That's kind of, that's what Coffee, Coffee and Cigarettes, cigarettes was. Yeah. There's like 11 different stories. That it, it's, yeah, because it's, it's short films yeah. that he shot over the years nice. with all the different actors he's worked with. See, I think that this would have worked in that, if they did that yeah. format. But well, this is also, the weird thing about this is like, this is pretty much his first, like, real comedy is it? Like, most of his films are, like, dramedies, yeah. more on the drama side with, like, very subtle dry humor in them. And even, this is very so, dry. This, and but it's, it's still, dry like, it's supposed zombie. to be still, like, the most, I would say, comedic film <laughs> yeah. that he's directed. Okay, that's cool. Uh, and I'm a, a huge fan. Yeah. Uh, I, need to, I need to explore his other works. Uh, definitely check out Mystery Train. Okay. Uh, that That is one of my favorites. I think Strangers in Paradise. Strangers in Paradise, Down by Law. Okay. Uh, and I hear a lot of Tom Waits. Dead Man is probably his one of his most well-known, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dead Man. That's a cult classic. With, uh, Johnny Incredible. Depp. Johnny Depp, Depp. yeah. Depp. It's like yeah. a weird, psychedelic Western. Western. <laughs> it's a good one. With, it's, with it's uh, a great it's soundtrack from Neil Young. Oh, yeah. cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's uh, yeah. one of my favorite cool. soundtracks. So, nice, nice. Uh, all right, so guys, see it, skip it. What do you? Th- if you're a fan of these kind of movies, it's worth seeing it. Yeah, because I really enjoy like kind of the message I got from the movie. I really enjoyed like uh, what I saw from it. Yeah, it was fun. Like what I basically got from it is they make a lot of allusions to like global warming with mm-hmm. the fact that mm-hmm. they're yeah. like making jokes of like global warming with the government saying it's not happening, and everyone's like, oh, obviously it's happening. And it's like everyone realizes zombies are going to happen, but there's kind of nothing you can do about it. And that's yeah. what I felt like. It's like living in a world where we know global warming, like. If we don't do anything within 30 years, then within 100 years, pretty much civilization as we know it, is going to fundamentally change. There's no way yeah. to survive. And that's what it's like. It's your characters who know you're in a horror movie, but there's no way out. You so an, an inadvertent the political know. message. <laughs> that's kind of what the movie felt like right, to me. Right. It's characters who are aware of like kind of the situation they're in and that hopelessness of, like, well, what do you do? You're on a sinking ship going down. How do you react? And it's just people living out their lives as best they can and kind of being very nonplussed about it. And that's what I kind of got from this movie. So a, comment, like a commentary on our impending doom. Yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what I got. Is like you're just trying to be make as many jokes as you can and be yeah. as lifting as you can as zombies are coming to eat your face. Like, that's true. Oh, hey, it's this person I know. Yeah. They're a zombie now. Because there really isn't any closure to this film no. without giving it away. The, and a even lot if of you loose gave ends. it away, yeah, there's there a, a lot of closure and a lot of loose ends, loose ends. ends. Yeah. And, a and a lot, lot of deaths. unanswered <laughs> questions. Yeah. yeah. But um, like, why were those people in this movie? Okay. Yeah. Uh, characters that just don't <laughs> and if like, you can have kill no these, ending. Why can't you kill these? And it's right. like yeah. you could have done. Well, something. no, kill there the head, a... kill the head. That's, yes, but we know that from from yeah. decades. Well, I, I do, I do like that. This is the first like self aware zombie movie. In in zombie movies, no one ever has ever heard of zombies before. <laughs> like in, in a vampire movie, they always know what vampires are. They're like, oh god, he's a vampire. Well, I guess it's been enough years. <laughs> in the, the, in this, they don't know like, what zombies are. They're, they're always like, oh my god, we're zombies. What like, is that? <laughs> like, what could this be? Why is it like, eating my face? <laughs> every time someone sees a dead person come back to life, and they got to shoot him three times in the stomach before one random person thinks, let's shoot him in the head. Yeah, yeah. right. It's <laughs> ridiculous. But it is a relatively fun movie. Oh, it's definitely and, fun. Or not. And I think people should see it. I do. You know, but check out Jim Jarmusch's um, previous entries, previous films. But this is probably not one of his yeah, just, better. No. Ones. Definitely not one not of his unless best. Unless you yeah. are best, yeah. Not unless you're vested in zombie movies and you feel the need that you have to be able to know well, what happened in I this one too. I wouldn't even say that, like, because I know people who went in like I had one friend who literally thought there was just going to be a zombie movie like Shaun of the Dead, and they came out like, "What the hell was that? That wasn't a zombie." I'm like, "Yeah, no, it's an art film." Mm-hmm. And he's exactly. Like, why that's didn't why I know I'm that? And it's, that's it's what I'm like, saying. You Experience a, a different. Movie, you're going to be weirdly disappointed. Well, they are. Pr- you've seen the poster, yes. right? It's just a hand yeah. coming out of the ground. That's like yeah. marketing for a, a typical zombie movie. Yeah. Period. And Jim Jarmusch's you know, name is on there, but people they see the poster, they go to it, they pay to go see a zombie movie, and that's what they thought they were going to go see. So. Anyway, 
Let's move on to our final film. Uh, we've the got, crown piece. I guess. I mean, <laughs> I was thinking of like saving this one for number for the second one, and then having the okay, du- Men in Black. Men in Black International. <laughs> And basically, um, we have Chris Hemsworth as the star agent. There he is, looking in fine form. Uh, joined by the rookie, played by Tessa Thompson. Um, and they are basically summoned to do battle with uh, evil, uh, evil aliens. Not a great movie by any standards. <laughs> but you know what? I, I, from what I've heard from the press, it was a little bit better than I thought it was going to be. And I was yeah. pleasantly surprised by that. Uh, Erica thoughts on this okay <laughs> i didn't hate it as much as i thought i came yeah. out of there and went oh that was okay <laughs> the end was a bit abrupt and the actual ending was really mm. ridiculous and obvious and it never got into any of the characters and the plot itself was missing all the great aspects of the men men in black concept it had good pieces it was, elements it was but, an yeah. attempt at a spin-off right to spin off the franchise into a new franchise you don't think it's a sequel no mm. okay i think of it as a spin-off because a sequel has to have some aspect that carries over even if the cast i mean i mean they I have the portrait if, they had yes, the, the painting yes portrait, it exists it proves it's the exact same place yeah but i think if they had made her will smith's character's daughter or something oh, excruciatingly painful like that then it would be a, then it would be like a sequel. So if they made it worse, it would have been a sequel. <laughs> yes. Okay. So if it was if as it was... bad as the last two Men in Black movies, well, no, then... three, two. three was okay. Three was actually, okay. honestly, I haven't seen it. <laughs> well, shame on you. Three I saw two actually... in the theater and then just, yeah, that was, like, was right. terrible. So, yeah. That was I would seventeen say years you could ago. Go see never this. forget it. It's not the end of the world. Mm. Don't see it for full, for a full price. If you are a diehard Men in Black fan, what is a diehard Men in Black fan? Someone who's read the comics. My, you dad, know they're out there. Like, my dad there is? loves Men in Black, so it's like okay. I took him to go see it, and he was great. happy. Like all he wants is a nice action film and just something okay. to laugh at, and he enjoyed it, and he just laughed his ass off. And it's like that's who the movie's for. Wait, is like, he a fan of the previous? Yeah, entries? yeah he loves the, oh, the good. last ones. Like he always enjoys like the big action movies like that. So I okay. got to see it for Father's Day. He enjoyed <laughs> it. So I'm like. Me, like, knowing film structure is like, this is a very shaky and not too great. Exactly. But right, if you right, don't right. look at it critically, if you just shut off your mind, it can be a fun one. It's yeah. better than a lot of other, like, bad action movies. Just the final movie. set, the final location of, like, the battle with the girl with the three arms. It was just so weird and Well, the villains, funky. all the villains were underdeveloped. Not just the three-armed, also the people who we believe are bad. Oh, those and... two guys who, like, lit on fire. Yeah, who yeah. like are made of energy Weird. and wearing like their skin. Their character designs were very well done. Yeah, no, they were beautiful oh, to look at. It was a beautiful at, movie. But... I mean, I love the props too. Like the weapons are great, the, the vehicles, even the the device that she uses to like. They're in the desert, you know, and she shoots yeah. that great prop design there. I must mm-hmm. say, but it's always been that way since the original. Yeah. So I respect that. I feel like there's this thing. Uh, I mean, I love the guy. Watching movies with Liam Neeson, <laughs> he's always enjoyable. Yeah. But I feel like when you put Liam Neeson in your movie, you're telling everyone this movie's not going to be as good as the director's previous work or whatever. Hmm. Uh, it's it's pretty much by just being like, we put Liam Neeson yeah. in it. <laughs> hey, go see it. Uh, I mean, like, look at, like, <laughs> Widows. The Yeah, it's like, uh, directed by... Um, was it? Uh, oh, yeah. Wasn't that Steve McQueen? Steve McQueen. Yeah. All year of his films ago. are incredible. And then He's he barely out, in it, though. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately. He, yeah, he put, he put out Widows. Yeah. And it's like, it was good. But it's like, <laughs> I think it's because Liam Neeson was involved. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, just throw him in. He, it'll make any, any movie better. Um, He's got a very specific set of skills. He does, and he <laughs> will find you. <laughs> CJ, what do you think of... MIB International. I enjoyed it. Like, I liked seeing uh, Chris Hemsworth and Jessica Thompson. Like, I love them both as actors. I thought they did a pretty good job playing these characters here. But, like, the movie never really went into them enough to, like, really explore who they were. Like, it goes a little bit into Chris Hemsworth and, like, has, like, a tiny bit to him, but there's not a lot of meat there. And Tessa Thompson, I really feel like by the end, we didn't actually learn a lot about her character. Yeah, just from the beginning when she was a kid and she sees her Yeah, like, I was way more invested in her in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A kid who knows that the Men in Black exists and wants to join them, and like I would have enjoyed seeing more of that. If they rode movie. that wave, it would have been yeah. a better movie. If they just yeah. focus on her. I feel her. like if they, they f- really just like had that as an excuse and then just jumped into what. And you know what? I, I, Wait, I, I had a question. Oh, so, yes. so you mean like if the movie only halfway through actually had her meet the Men in Black, and before that she still? No, I'm saying searched. if we saw more of like 
her trying to find them, and then like mm. uh, her actually training. Her okay. journey. Yeah. Like, I enjoy like my favorite part of the first Man of Black is when Will Smith is first like recruited, and then like the kind <laughs> of training the stuff room she and does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like when he's in the alien shootout gallery, and mm-hmm. he, everyone else is shooting the aliens, and he's shooting the little girl. Yeah. And, like, well, she's got that, advanced like, algebra. That that's <laughs> advanced stuff. She's out here with all these monsters on the street. That's not a safe neighborhood. Yeah. And it's like that's one of my favorite scenes. And this snarling beast. Weird he's not snarling. He's sneezing. He's using it. That's great. Right. This guy, he's just working out. <laughs> I'd be going <laughs> angry if and someone came and disrupted my like work. And then the scene where he's on the, 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 the park bench right over the water, the battery, you know, the battery mm-hmm. and uh, he's just like com- contemplating his life and should yeah. he become a man in black? And That was a great I scene, mean, too. I, that, I think the problem they had with that character in general is that like they made her so ready for it that mm. she was like, that's why we didn't get anything like that because she was like, oh, I'm yeah. ready for this. And then basically just told them, like, no, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Too confident. So she, she was didn't... too confident. Right, right, too perfect. There them. was no, like, well, here's a surprise. <laughs> her only surprise was that in England they drive on the other side of the car. <laughs> that was, like, her That's big not really and her much surprise. And her surprise that she had a title. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Pony was cute. Oh, yeah, of course. Like, I, I went in expecting to hate the little CGI character because yeah. <laughs> I love Cam- Camille Nanjiani, like the yeah. actor who played him. Like, yeah. I love him. But I was ready to just be like, this is going to be the most great yeah. character. And by the end, I'm like, damn it, I like them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's basically the, the pug in um, the second one. Yeah. Yes. They, like, really oh, yeah. focused on that absurd they, uh, character. This is one of those movies where I haven't seen it quite so much ever before in a film where all the dialogue from the trailer is not in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> like, I guess because they don't want to, like, spoil things for you. Mm. Uh, every line is just, like, overdubbed from a different part of the movie in the yeah. trailer. It's very weird. It is weird. If you, like, that see the trailer weird. and then watch the movie, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, like, <laughs> I like the trailer for this movie because it actually didn't give a lot away. Like, it gave yeah. you just enough to want to go see it. Mm-hmm. Whereas now I feel like a lot of trailers are like, we'll show you 85% of the movie. Yeah. And it's or like, you only... know what the ending's yes. going to be, but we just don't mm. happen to see that yet. And that's what most movies are. I think a, a good example of, of that is uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, if you guys haven't seen yeah. it. Yeah. It's like, they show pretty much all the movie. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that one, it's based on a true story. Like, yeah. So we know what Charlo, what Charlie mm-hmm. Manson does like with mm-hmm. his whole... Like, right, we right. know it's about that, so we know where it's going, so that's fine. But it does show like a lot of bits of the movie. Yeah, and the best parts, probably. Okay, guys. So, And also, I want to make note, I know you're a soundtrack guy. Yes. Um, and even though he did work with somebody else on the score, yeah. what do you think of Danny Elfman's iconic theme? Uh, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's not one of my favorite Elfman uh, works. Sure, you know? sure. It's watered down. Yeah, you know, I mean, even even his you know his previous Man of Black work, not my favorite of his works. Okay. But uh, I mean, it's still you know it's 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 got a presence. Yeah. Uh, you and know. the first one's pretty iconic too. The first one, yeah. That's like I think that was his first uh, Oscar nomination. Yeah, it was that ninety seven. Probably is like. First non uh, Tim Burton score. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he was never nominated for. I think he, yeah. he won a Grammy for Batman. Yeah. So, but, but. what did you guys think of the music? Yeah. Men in Black. Uh, didn't notice it too much. No, I, I didn't I notice. Heard, like, it was kind of in the background. Yeah. 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 I, I missed a special. good rap song from Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Where was that? Yeah. I, Men in Black. And he didn't even <laughs> produce it or anything. I don't no. think. No, no well, involvement. it's not his movie. Right. Well, Spielberg produced. Yes. it. He did all three, all four now. Yeah. But um, that's cool. All right, guys, so see it or skip it, Matt. Uh, <laughs> I would say see it. I mean, don't. I wouldn't pay full price for it. Maybe right. Okay. okay. I'm with you on that yeah. one. On the weekend. It's, a, it's entertaining. It's, it's yeah, okay. It was fun. Might have been my favorite of the three. So no. I'd say, if yes. If a movie you want to go see, then go see it. Like, yeah. I thought I was going to hate it, and I'm like, okay. But yeah. yeah, don't see it for full price. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Well, guys, I have a little plug. Uh, it came out. Fairly recently, but the 25th anniversary of uh, Forrest Gump, the Tom Hanks classic, directed Zemeckis. by Robert Zemeckis, mm-hmm. classic one, Best Picture in 1990, well, 95 for 94, um, revolutionary uh, visual effects mm-hmm. by ILM, phenomenal movie, yeah. um, and this basically the Blu-ray just came out, 25th anniversary, and they're also having uh, special screenings, I think the 23rd and the 24th, pretty much all over the country. So, yeah, um, you know, in the next uh, few days, if you want to see a classic film that defined my childhood, one of them anyway, check out Forrest Gump. There it is. (laughs) And, guys, um, we only have 10 minutes left. Um, Actually... Why don't we just talk about Forrest Gump for a little bit? All right, sure. <laughs> oh. uh, no, Erica, oh, there we go. That was a reaction. Yes. 
Not a fan. Great hatred of the movie. Why? I'm curious. No, it just feels ridiculous. It feels it's so a, it's ridiculous a that someone can be in all those places, just inserted in the background. Right time at the right moment. It's ridiculous in every way. I mean, <laughs> I'd rather watch Watchmen, which does the same concept. It's about the same length of time, too. About yes. two, two and a half hours. <laughs> Oh. And the feather floating See, around. Like my own and fan theory about it, because Robert Zemeckis directed it. Yeah. That what if someone took Doc Brown's DeLorean, went back in time, <laughs> so that this way he could every be inserted notable, in every historical yes. event, like meet all the presidents, and then telling his story about, oh, this was me, and it's just Biff Tannen when he won, a, won everything. It's like this is when I met the president, and well, again when I met the president. Well, and in a, a, that would be, a and that would be interesting. <laughs> in a weird way, though, Forrest Gump is time traveling because he's going back yeah. in his memory to each notable moment in, in history. So it is like time travel in a way. But um, I don't know. This movie, is, as a kid, it's amazing. But, yeah. You know, I guess you look, I was I was a, a preteen when it came out. Okay. Or, or teen, I, I was a teenager when it came out. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I liked it when I saw it in the theater. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it's definitely not one of my fav- favorite Zemeckis films or Tom Hanks films. Tom Hanks is like my favorite actor. Well, you know, my favorite one of I, it might be my favorite Tom Hanks film is also a Zemeckis film, Castaway. Oh, okay. Castaway is that's incredible. A, that's a beautiful film. It's too. Incredible film. Yeah, it's yeah. brilliantly acted, and it's just yeah. him and a volleyball. It's yeah. great. But um, uh, yeah, but great soundtrack. Oh yeah, uh, Alan Silvestri. You know, one of one of one of those rare double disc soundtracks. I remember the yeah, CD. It was just I so packed full of good music. Up. It had like every notable pop song from that from yeah. the 50s, 60s to 70s. Yeah, it yeah, was a good time. It was a pretty good mix. Yeah. yeah. CJ, do you have fond memories of uh, Forrest Gump? I remember it being a good movie, but the way I basically think of it is mm. the way that kind of the Christmas story, like the reason that movie's popular, mm-hmm. uh-huh. is this is one of those movies where there's not actually like an overarching like character arc. Like, there's not really a journey. We just see a series of vignettes of like what happens to this person, yeah. and it's the perfect movie to have playing in the background where you could walk in at any point, and you can sit down for five <laughs> yes. minutes and enjoy what you see, and then leave. That's like, why it's on TV all the time. It's a series of small <laughs> stories just being told by the same person, some, right. and that's some the same classic reason, like, vignettes. Yeah, that's why Christmas Story is so popular. It's like. Christmas Story isn't actually a really good movie. Like, no. I don't enjoy it. I mean, it's good. But it's but a movie that you can walk in and see it. So that's why they keep playing it on TV. I don't think I've seen it from beginning to end since I was, like, maybe 11 or 12 years old. Oh, it just showed it? Yeah, that's kind of what, yeah, yeah. fl- what they bank on. Oh, we, had, we had Flick there. <laughs> see, I, I, I almost uh, went to that. It was, it was, it was, I mean, it, it was the first time I had seen it in its entirety in a long time. <laughs> and it was nice. Cause yeah. Because, like, actually watching it, like, from beginning to end. It's likable. You know, yeah, I mean, I saw it in the theater when it came out. Okay. And, uh, and, you know, 83, right? Yeah. Okay, wow. And, you know, it's like one of those movies I've loved since I was a kid, but I haven't seen it in a long time. And, you know, ba- based on, like, the fact that it's on all the time. Right. That actually used to be my number one favorite Christmas movie. Yeah. But in within the last decade or so, I kind of switched gears to Scrooge. Scrooge? Yeah. Scrooge, Scrooge is, is definitely up there. I love Scrooge. Uh, I, I, <laughs> it's... Quite possibly my favorite Christmas movie. That I could watch from beginning to end. Danny Elfman as well. Danny, early oh. Elfman too. Yep, yep. Eighty-eight. I say Die Hard is my favorite Christmas movie. <laughs> yeah. Die Hard uh, two is my second think. favorite. Like Die Hard, and then uh, the Grinch of Soul Christmas, the Boris Karloff. But we've had issues with Die Hard on this show. Like, is it a Christmas movie or is it an action movie disguised as a Christmas movie, or vice versa? Well, it's like every Shane Black movie. Is a Christmas movie. Christmas movie. Christmas Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang so is a Christmas yeah. movie. That's Die good. Hard. Uh, I mean, uh, Lethal Weapon's a Christmas movie. Yep. Um, Iron Man three is a Christmas movie. <laughs> Shane Black, very good. Yeah, there. I mean, you know, he just does Christmas movies. Yeah, Black Christmas, Black. great Christmas movie. Yeah. Wait, is that the one Margot Kidder? No, up? that's the one with the serial killer, like yeah, the yeah, original, yeah, the, like, the, the sorority house. Oh yeah, that was yeah, yeah. Margot Kidder. I yeah, forgot. early seventies. Yeah. Yep, that was pretty good. Yep. Yeah, that was like the inspiration for all the slasher movies. Erica, favorite uh, holiday movie, Christmas Oh, movie? we did that six months ago when I saw Let's do you. it again. <laughs> I decided to switch it up on you, and I decided to throw in while you were sleeping. Oh, I think you mentioned oh, that the last wow. time. That's what I did last time. Yeah, I threw yeah. it away from Macaulay Culkin's Home Alone or The Nutcracker or, yeah, or the, like, the Muppet, Tre- no, uh, Muppet, Muppet Christmas, Christmas Carol uh, right, right, right. Christmas or time. any of the things that I grew up with that I really loved, and I threw it elsewhere. No, Do you know what I always thought about when I watched Forrest Gump? Mm, I always wanted to know who would be win in a football game, him or the water boy. Ooh, interesting. Bobby Boucher. From yes. Adam Sandler. Could he outrun Bobby Boucher running head on at him, screaming? Well, Boucher wasn't really fast. He was just very forceful. He was like strong. Yeah, so the question is, would he be able to outrun him? Oh, and get the horse him? just kept running. Yeah. I it was just running. kept running. Exactly. <laughs> what happens when an unstoppable object meets an immovable force? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the topic for a different show, CJ. <laughs> 
All right, guys, five more minutes left. I hate looking at the clock. It's, it's, well, it's really funny <laughs> that, you know, it's like, oh, fitting three movies in. Like, will we be able to do it? I didn't think and I would do it. And then you just jump like, ahead hey. and you're like, okay, I'm going to announce the time and now yeah. we have to figure out what to do. I know, I don't know. I know what we're doing. Um, I just wanted to hear from you guys if you have uh, anything you want to plug as usual, anything that's coming up. CJ, I know you. You're always. I always ca- catch you off guard with yeah, that. Yeah, no, we started filming on mm. a short project, so hopefully we can get some stuff going soon. Eternal Alliance. Uh, yes, uh, working with uh, Vinny Bonfanti and uh, Jake Ramos. Cool. Anything? Can you talk about the film yet? Or uh, no, it's just a short comedy thing we're going to do for YouTube. It's a lot. It should be a very fun concept. Everyone seems to like the script, so nice. You just got to actually sit down and be able to film it. So that the hardest part is just getting everyone together. But it's written but, and it's all set. Yeah, it's all written. Go. We have it planned out, so it's like we just have to be able to get people together and shoot it. So. Cool. Well, let us know. Keep us updated with that. Yep. No, when it's out, I'll definitely plug in and have like a YouTube. And if you need an actor, I mean, I'd love to. Volunteer my services. Yeah, no, if we need something <laughs> in the background, we'll let you know. Thank you. <laughs> Erica, anything happening you want to uh, Right plug? now, no, I actually was on a project, and the main person, he got injured, and so mm, okay. he had a hernia, and I was like, don't do anything for three months. Hmm. I keep reminding him, because I don't trust him. Okay. So that's on hold until... Well, I'm sorry for your <laughs> friend. <laughs> I hope he feels better. Me too. That sucks. <laughs> All right, Matt, anything... Uh... Uh, as always, Cult Cafe at the Cinema Arts Center in Huntington, uh, every Saturday night at 10 o'clock. Uh, next week we are doing uh, Michael Rappaport's uh, Tribe Called Quest documentary. Hmm. Uh, we got Star Trek The Motion Picture coming up. <laughs> we got Ghostbusters coming yes. up. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, plenty of good things. Check us out on Facebook. It's, uh, I think, facebook.com. Backslash Call Cafe NY, I believe. Uh-huh. But you'll find us. Look up Call Cafe. Cal- Call Cafe. It's up there. Uh, it's great. Yeah, every Saturday night. So. Nice. Uh, do you have any, any guests planned for these upcoming screens? Uh, no guests upcoming. Okay. Uh, cool. Well, we could, you know, I am with the New York City Ghostbusters, so if you need any assistance, oh, yeah. well, we could talk. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. So, a few more minutes. Um, some plugs from our wonderful sponsor, Magnitude Jewelry. Uh, we've got June 30th, the Holistic Fair in Staten Island. July 28th, the Awaken Fair at the Roger Smith Hotel in New York City. And we have another event uh, coming up later this year, September 20th to the 22nd in Massachusetts. We'll keep you up to date with, um, with those dates and uh, events. But uh, we actually have two more minutes, guys. <laughs> two more minutes. Yes, and I'm curious... What's coming out that uh, you're looking forward to seeing? Uh, movies. Yes. Movies in the theater that I'm looking... That you I mean, to go on, see. honestly, the only thing <laughs> I can think of that I really, really am looking forward to is uh, the Spider-Man movie. Mm. That will be interesting. That's a good one. Um, yeah. I'm glad. That was my favorite thing about uh, Men in Black, I think, uh-huh. was finally seeing the the spoiler trailer uh, before a movie. Oh, nice, uh, nice. So, so... It's out of the bag. If you haven't seen uh, Endgame yet, yeah. uh, you can't avoid the trailer now. <laughs> so, uh, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I think a, a month is a good grace period yeah. for, for yeah. spoilers. <laughs> Definitely. No, That's two a, weeks. Two weeks, really? No. I, I well, mean, for, for a movie that big, big yeah. I would big, say yeah. like... I mean, that ban yeah. on the spoilers, two weeks. I'll give you two weeks for a smaller film. But no. Endgame, that's what a solid month. No, because like one... people need to ask questions and they need to say what was up with this scene. I, I don't understand. And they see it. YouTube videos. I agree. I, need... I agree with you because because it's a huge movie. It's like the biggest movie, not only of the summer but like of all time. I mean, yeah. maybe not it's, of all time. It's this close to beating out that garbage film Avatar. Uh, <laughs> yes. I like Avatar. A and, little... I don't. It's not great. But... I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I prefer Nickelodeon's Avatar. Yeah. I prefer, yeah, Pocahontas yeah. and Dances with Wolves. Yeah. So the M. Night Shyamalan Avatar like. No. Not the <laughs> <movie>. <laughs> no. Oh, that the yeah. James Cameron Avatar is better then. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's the rank of Avatars. It's Avatar, then Avatar, and then yeah. Avatar. <laughs> Exactly. Erica, w- anything you're looking forward to coming up? Actually, not that much. I mean, I'm looking forward to Quentin Tarantino, yes. but I'm not yeah. ex- truly like life or death excited. What I was waiting for was Dark Phoenix, which mm. came out. I was ready to be disappointed, <laughs> but I needed to see how it was going to end. I was waiting. They postpone it. They postpone it. Mm. And 
even on TV, there's nothing really to look forward to right now. Yeah. They've announced that things are going off the air, which have devastated me. I finished my star shows. Spanish Princess only has like one episode left. The thing on Cinemax finished last week. Mm -hmm. Warrior. Game of Thrones is over. The Arrowverse isn't on until next year. Eric is a TV buff, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> I've been watching Krypton. It just came back. Oh, cool. I'm slightly interested in this season. I think Lobo looks interesting, but it's I like... I really like the Lobo design. Like yeah. that yes, it's love. very promising. He's a great he looks like he could be the main man, but I've only seen like 30 seconds of him, so who knows what. All right. But um, nothing too exciting. Okay. CJ, anything? Uh, I know there is stuff I want to see. I can't think of it, but uh, the one movie I'm really looking forward to this summer is uh, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. I yes. love those books when I was a kid. And when I heard they were doing a movie, it's like, <laughs> I like the director, so I'm like, I had some hope for like how this is going to look. Who's directing but, it? Del Toro. Oh, oh yeah. yes. That's really? No, he's producing. Del Toro's producing it. It's like, I can't remember. Oh, really? I love it, but I know, <laughs> I know he's done good stuff. I can't remember his name off the top of my head now. Okay. I wish I could look it up, but... Uh, I will find it one second. Yeah, like, I Scary. really like their approach. Yeah. Because I was worried when I first heard about it, like, how can you take any one of these stories and try to make a movie out of it? Okay. And instead, making it about kids who find a book full of these stories, and the stories come to life, and they send all the monsters after them. Okay. It's such a really <laughs> good approach. Del Toro yes. wrote it. And yeah. Andre Orvidel, can't really pronounce that. It's got a weird spelling. Um, okay, guys, we're out of time. Yeah. But I want to thank you for being here, thank guys. You. This was great. Matt Rohr and Erica A., CJ Oakland, you guys are always welcome here. It's always great talking movies with you guys. And I want to thank everyone watching at home and on their devices, their tablets, their laptops, what have you. And also, I want to wish all the dads again happy Father's Day. And we'll be back with more Unger the Radar uh, next week. I'm your host, Randy Unger. Until then, I'll see you. Take care, guys. <laughs>